So our last talk uh, this afternoon, this evening, is the RAS Diary talk, and it's uh, Mahesh Anand from the Open University who's going to talk to us on the dark side of the moon. Mahesh. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the invitation, and thank you for staying. Um, I think um, when I was approached by the RAS meeting organizer to talk about this topic, um, I guess I didn't have a choice, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> but but I, I think I'm, I'm glad that I actually took this challenge on because um, uh, hopefully I will be able to convey to you uh, some of the, not, not just the science bit, but also some of the, maybe the, uh, some art, some maybe some philosophy, and uh, what better stage than to finish and go into wine reception, right? <laughs> so, um, so hopefully, you know, we will find something to, to suit for everyone. Um, I put the dark side in quotation because, uh, you know, um, we all know that what dark means here is something that is um, perhaps less well known to us, uh, something that we have not as well explored as um, some other things, right? So I think that's the sentiment. But nevertheless, um, we all knew something like uh, up to 60 years ago, in fact a month, uh, 60 years from today, that we only saw the moon like this, only the near side, right? Um, with the telescope and uh, with the naked eye. And, and moon is such a fascinating object because it allows us to engage the wider community. Maybe anybody, anybody, they don't need to know anything, but you just use moon as a hook to get them interested into astronomy, planetary science, and you just name it, you know, technology, whatever it is. So I'm, I'm really glad that I'm standing here and talking to you at this meeting uh, about the moon. Uh, I'm a sample scientist, so I work with uh, the lunar samples, in, in particular the Apollo uh, samples, but I haven't got any samples from the far side yet. So much of my talk is also uh, going to convince you, hopefully, that actually we do need some samples from the far side of the moon, as I would call it from now on. Now, I also brought here a piece of the moon, uh, which you are welcome to touch. You can touch the moon. Uh, I brought the moon to you uh, during the wine reception, but this is a lunar meteorite. There is a chance that this could be from the far side, but we don't know for sure. Okay, but we need to go to the far side to really know what it is. Um, you know, <laughs> I know, I know, but we are going to reveal it, right? So this is actually what was called the dark side, or what is actually the far side, the very first glimpse of it, which uh, was captured, as I mentioned, uh, almost uh, 60 years ago. And, and next year is going to be... Um, you know, fantastic year because there are so many anniversaries that are happening in the year 2019. You know, so we can have 60 years of this. We are going to have uh, 50 years of Apollo 8 next month. Uh, and then, of course, we go into the Apollo 11 50 years anniversary. So there are lots of things that are planned, and I will mention a couple of them to you during the talk. So here we go. You know, up until this point, no human being has ever seen the far side. I showed you the you know, picture taken 10 years ago by Luna 3, but that was by a spacecraft. In this case, right, three human beings actually went around the moon and did manage to see the far side. And when they came out from there, they saw this blue planet, right, which we now treasure so much. So, so the beauty of the Earth, how fragile it is, everything came about because we aimed for the moon. Because we went to the moon to actually look back at our own planet and realize how fragile it is mm -hmm. and our place in the universe. So again, you know, this is the, the philosophical side of things that lunar exploration actually brings us. So after the Apollo 8, uh, we had to wait for almost 40 years to get to something else which is an Eiffel. And I would like you to spend about a minute and a half watching this beautiful video which I found on the Guardian newspaper website. So hopefully the video will work and the sound will also work. Just give me five seconds and see if I can make it work. And I'll let you enjoy this. We know how the moon looks. 
universe from here on Earth. But what does it look like from the other side? Well, for one thing, we can also see the Earth. The spinning Earth looms large in this time-lapse telescopic view, made possible by computer graphics. We're looking along the imaginary line connecting the Earth and the Moon. From this vantage point, the Moon will be full soon, but on Earth, it's a waning crescent. The far side of the Moon has fewer of the smooth, dark spots, called Maria, that cover the side that faces Earth. Instead, the far side is covered with craters of all sizes. In the second perspective, we're much closer to the Moon, using a wide-angle lens that makes the distant Earth seem smaller. With our view fixed on the Moon, the rest of the solar system seems to dance and whirl around us. Before the Space Age, no one knew what was on the other side of the Moon. Since 2009, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has been making some of the most detailed global maps of the Moon's surface, making it much easier for everyone to see what it's like on the other side. Okay, so let's go back. Um, I hope you, you've really, you know, got the visual uh, there. Yes, it was all um, based on graphics, but actually on the actual images that were collected by NASA Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO in short, that is still going strong. Uh, and for the next, I think, five or six slides, I'm sim simply going to show you uh, slides which has both hemispheres of the moon. So on the right-hand side, you will see what we started with as the dark side and see how we actually built up our knowledge over the years about this uh, dark side, which is actually, as I said, is the far side of the moon. And in 1994, there was a mission that NASA sent called Clementine Mission, which collected simply this albedo uh, map. And it is very obvious. You look at it and you see there is a difference in the near side and the far side. Seems simple. It's an observation. The question is, what is going on. And I don't think anybody can fully explain it yet. Okay? So that's just about the albedo that highlights that there is a difference. That gets translated into topography. Now here what you're looking at is those colors that are in red, they are higher uh, features, and those that are in blue are like <coughs> basins and the floors of impact craters. And again, far side has got much more contrasting uh, relief uh, and the differences in topography than the near side. What you see there at the bottom here in blue is a giant impact basin which we call South Pole Aitken Basin, which is about 2,500 kilometer in diameter and is thought to have formed right at the start of the solar system, so right around about 4.5 billion years, 4.4 billion years. We don't know that. And in fact, one of the um, ideas floating around in the lunar community for the last 10, 20 years, since these global <coughs> maps became available, is to actually visit this basin because um, we, we believe that by sampling material from this basin, we can actually start answering some of the very big solar system questions. Now, uh, about 10 years ago, we had data from uh, this beautiful mission called GRAIL mission. It's called Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory Mission, again, uh, by NASA. And, and what you are looking at here is the, um, a map of crustal thickness, or how thick the crust is on the moon. I mean, the previous talk, you heard all about the present-day uh, deformation on the Earth's crust, but on the moon, you don't have active deformation. So what you're looking at is presumably a crust on the moon that is quite ancient, except in those places where actually it has been resurfaced by later volcanism. But still, they are quite old compared to what we see on Earth. Volcanism on the moon ceased long time ago, close to around one billion year. And that, for the moon, is still quite young. But on Earth, it's, it's still happening today. 
Now what you also see here are some of these purple stars. And the reason these are purple stars are because there was a Japanese mission that went to the moon called Kaguya. And based on that uh, <coughs> mission data, scientists suggested that these are the places where they say that there are mantle exposed. Now we don't have any mantle samples from the moon, but they contested that actually if you combine the crustal <coughs> thickness data and their spectral imaging data, you would find olivine. Now, whether that olivine is of mantle origin or not is another question. And that's why we need to go and sample some of these materials so that we can analyze them in the lab and confirm if that is indeed is the case. So moving on, um, here is a global titanium map. Now, those of you who are not familiar with uh, lunar geology, uh, it's, it's very simple. Titanium is a key element that actually um, you know, sort of helps you classify uh, rocks on the moon because titanium is primarily locked up into a mineral called ilmenite. And these minerals actually occur in volcanic rock types uh, on the moon. Uh, they are found in so-called Maria, you know, those that uh, ancient astronomers thought were seas. So what you're looking here are these red spots. These red spots are actually titanium hotspots. Again, you see on the near side, these red features correspond to those Marias from where we have samples in the Apollo collection. But on the far side, there is hardly any, very, very little. So again, titanium content in the magma is a reflection of what is going on inside the body. Why do we have so many lava flows on the near side with so much of titanium, whereas any lava flows that we have on the far side seem to have much lower titanium? So again, it is telling us something about the geological evolution of the moon. The same applies to iron. I wouldn't go into detail, but it is very easy to see that titanium and iron, they almost go together, except in the South Pole Aitken area. So again, if you focus on the right-hand image, when I go there, there's much more iron in the South Pole Aitken Basin area compared to titanium. Now that is kind of bothering people because this means that in South Palatkin Basin, first of all, you have some mare basalts, but those mare basalts are not the same that you see on the near side. So they appear to be of different competition, certainly in, in terms of titanium. <coughs> are they different in terms of any other element? We have to see, because there is another map that was collected, and in this case, it is for a radioactive element, as you know, thorium. Now, it turns out that before Apollo missions happened, we had no idea what the global geology of the moon was like, especially with respect to the distribution of thorium. And it turned out that all Apollo missions actually went to these regions that were characterized by very high thorium. Right? So 40 years after the Apollo missions ended, all of our understanding of the moon is almost all is derived from samples that were collected from an anomalous region of the moon, right? Now that presents us with two things. I mean, either we can say, oh, why did we do that? Or we can say, amazing opportunity here to actually now with a global perspective, could we revisit some of the areas that were not visited by the moon, elsewhere on the moon, and try to come up with a coherent and consolidated story. And, and one of those places is going to be South Poletkin Basin, because as you can see, there's a the little bit of thorium enhancement compared to the rest of the far side. So every time we think about the big science questions, South Poletkin Basin seemed to come up over and over again. And therefore, it is becoming one of the prime targets if you want to go uh, uh, back to the moon. Now, this is uh, a slide that actually my colleague Jessica Flaho uh, shared with me, and it simply shows that if I put this far side, it will ha have nothing. It's no mission that has actually soft landed on the far side. But it is about to change, hopefully in less than a month or so. And I will tell you about that in, in a few minutes. I mentioned to you that I'm a sample scientist, and I can't give a talk about the moon without bringing samples into relevance. Now, in this case, we have sample return missions 
from the moon. Uh, you all probably very fondly remember many of the Apollo missions, and as I said, next year is going to be a big year for our Apollo 11 celebrations, but we also mustn't forget that we had three Soviet lunar sample return missions. Yeah? So all together, we sampled nine locations on the moon. Based on our study of those samples is what we have subsequently developed, our ideas about how planets form, uh, et cetera. But the question is, we don't have any rocks collected from the far side. What will they tell if we collect them? And I mentioned to you that we do have lunar meteorites, and maybe some of them are from the far side. Some of them do not match with everything we know about the near side, so we say that by the idea of elimination, they must be from the far side. But we still don't know where on, on the far side, so we have to go there to get that context. I just want to quickly run through with you maybe two or three key findings that you know, um, I'm sure most of you already know about it, but it doesn't hurt to actually um, re reconfirm those. And especially if this talk is going to be recorded and made available later on, then the other viewers might not be as familiar as the audience here. One of the biggest findings that came out of our studies on the Apollo um, uh, samples that were returned from the moon was that up until the Apollo missions, we really didn't know how the moon formed. There were lots of theories that it actually co accreted with the Earth, that it actually uh, was captured by the Earth, or it may have actually um, come out of the Earth, like what is known as the fission theory. All of those theories were put to rest when we had the real samples in the lab. And probably one of the most um, you know, sort of unexpected discovery was that how close the Earth and the Moon were in terms of their chemical composition, in terms of their isotopic composition. But that presented itself with a big problem because we couldn't reconcile the geochemical data with the dynamical data. And it took quite a few years to actually come up with lots of different possibilities, lots of different scenarios to form the moon by what is now known as the giant impact, where a planetary body moving around through the solar system comes and hits the Earth, material gets flung out into a debris disk, and the moon accretes from that. The problem has always been is that moon was always thought to have formed from the impactor material. So if the moon and the Earth are so similar geochemically, that meant that the impactor had to be exactly the same. But we don't find any two planetary body in the solar system as the same. So how can we assume that in this case, the impactor was exactly the same as the Earth? But the availability of Apollo samples allowed us to measure them to the highest precision in the lab and really demonstrate that there is no difference and not challenge people who are doing uh, modeling work to come up with a giant impact model that would allow that geochemical characteristic to be reconciled. So as of today, our understanding is that the moon did form through a giant impact, but probably at that time, the Earth was rotating extremely fast and the impact was extremely violent. And it is called, um, you know, still it is known as giant impact, but we still don't have a good constraint on the size of the impactor. All we know is this impact happened and the material was so well mixed that subsequently the Earth and Moon effectively formed from the same material. There are some details, but that's for some other day. Now, another key uh, theory that came out from the um, studies of Apollo samples is this concept of lunar magma ocean. Now, uh, I, I just told you about the giant impact. What is going to happen is that the moon is going to coalesce from a very hot material. That material is then going to become uh, molten, and then it is going to solidify. So it's very simple theory, but this was confirmed by the type of samples that were collected on the lunar surface. So for example, those bright uh, regions that you see in the night, those lunar highlands are nothing but made up of plagioclase feldspar, which in this scenario formed because of flotation 
towards the surface of that magma ocean. So again, having the sample in hand allowed us to develop theories and ideas about how planetary bodies reach, in this case, the moon. But remember, this is all on the basis of samples from the near side. We have to await for the samples from the far side to see whether there are any complications and revisions necessary. And I again tell you that meteorites are already hinting at that possibility that our simple concept of lunar magma ocean is not as simple as it seems. So it will require revisions. So I, just, I think you can see uh, where I'm coming from. Now, moving on. I think in the last 10 years, probably the most exciting discovery in terms of the moon has been the detection of or the discovery of water on the moon and in the moon through the lunar samples. Now, if we didn't have the Apollo samples in our collection for 40 plus years, we would have never achieved this. Now, that goes to show how well these samples are curated at the Johnson Space Center in Houston and how they are made available to the international community like us because remember, Apollo missions were US-funded missions. The US taxpayer paid for it, but it does not matter. If you are a lunar scientist, you want to work on lunar samples, you are anywhere in the world, you request the sample, and as long as you are capable of doing the science that NASA can you know, uh, be confident of, you will be allocated lunar samples. So we are ever so grateful for that access. Now, in 2008, this big paper came out by Alberto Sal and colleagues reporting that they had detected parts per million uh, water in lunar volcanic glasses. Now, parts per million doesn't sound too much, but up until that point, the moon is thought to have less than one part per billion. So three orders of magnitude. And since then, we have done a lot of work in which we have actually shown that the, probably the inside of the moon contains about 100 ppm water. <coughs> So that's quite a lot of water compared to what we thought Moon had, and it has lots of geological ramifications for how the lunar interior actually has evolved over time. Now, the, there is a lot of work going on to relate what is in the inside of the Moon with what is on the surface of the Moon. So there has been a lot of effort. In this case, on the right-hand side, you see some images where people have predicted that they have identified from remote sensing measurements areas on the moon that contain the same amount of water that is seen in the pyroclastic glasses. And that is still an ongoing work, as you can see. This paper came out last year. In fact, there was a paper this year. Now, round about the time when samples were revealing that there were water in the moon was this Indian mission called Chandrayaan-1 that carried a NASA instrument called m -cube, the Moon Mineralogy Mapper. And based on the data from Moon Mineralogy Mapper, there was a paper published by Peter et al. in 2010 that showed that actually if you go toward the higher latitude, north and south, these blue regions, uh, they show that there is an enhanced water signature. Now, these enhanced water signatures were associated with a source from the solar wind. So, so it seems like on the moon you have got water that might have come from multiple sources. Water that formed with the moon, the water that is coming from the solar wind, and water that is present at the poles, which could have come from multiple sources, but most likely it has come from lots of impactors that are actually hitting the moon. And because the poles have such low temperatures, as low as minus 150 degrees centigrade, and moon has no inclination, because its axis of rotation is almost vertical, these regions never see any sunlight. And therefore, any volatile, any water that gets there gets trapped. So right now, in the world, there is a lot of uh, interest in understanding a bit more about lunar polar regions, both north and south poles. And there has been multiple data sets confirming that actually these permanently shadowed regions could have water ice within first meter of the surface, and, and I think that has uh, worked very well for the Google Lunar X Prize, because lots of commercial companies now want to go to the moon to harvest the water for commercial purposes. That's fine, I think that is just creating um, a, a, a good, good level of activity in the wider community, and, and we get a lot of science out of it. So as I said, there are lots of 
um, plans to target these lunar poles for, um, you know, not, not just for uh, commercial purposes, but actually if you want to stay on the moon for a longer period of time, you do need water because then you can derive um, oxygen for, uh, for breathing or you can actually split the water to, 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 to produce your rocket fuel as liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Now, I told you that within a month or so, you are going to have a soft landing on the lunar far side, and that is going to happen through this mission uh, led by um, Chinese National Space Agency called Chang'e 4. Now, Chang'e 4 was a backup um, spacecraft for Chang'e 3, but because that was a success, the Chinese decided to actually redirect it elsewhere, and they have now decided to go to the far side of the moon. And it's very clever because they had already launched a relay satellite that you might have heard about earlier this year is going to go and hover around the L2 Lagrange point. Chang'e 4 goes, lands on the far side, communicates through this relay satellite data back to the Earth. Something that astronaut Jack Schmidt, who was the last person to have walked on the moon, has been actually championing for many years. And finally, China has actually done this, or will do it shortly. Now, this spacecraft has uh, a lander and the rover combination has lots of payloads, including many European ones. And, and one of the, I think, things that is exciting the community is the possibility of doing uh, radio astronomy uh, from the far side. So I'm really looking forward to, you know, how, how that comes about. And if you are interested, there, there is something about the landing area. I think I can skip because there is not much time. But China is not stopping there. They have something called Chinese Lunar Exploration Program. And, and some of us in this room are actually involved in discussion with the Chinese National Space Agency through our work with the European Space Agency to be involved in future missions, especially the one called Chang'e 5 that is going to bring some samples back. And that should happen next year. So hopefully we will have some more new samples to work with. Now, Recently, NASA and ESA came together and signed an MOU to work towards something what they call Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway, a bit of a mouthful. But I quite like the idea because what it is, is it is not saying that every time you want to go to the moon, you have a new mission. In this case, you go to the moon, you park there, and you have regular access to the lunar surface as and when necessary, but you also do other solar system science from that gateway. And, and therefore, actually, it is going to reduce the cost and it is going to enhance an integrated or, or, or support an integrated approach by which we can explore not just the moon, but Mars and beyond. Um, and we can be even more ambitious. Uh, we can think about, you know, if there is indeed water that can be extracted easily from the, at the lunar poles, there are technologies that can be developed so that you can go anywhere on the moon and extract water. Um, then I think the possibility of staying on the moon for longer term becomes just a little bit more um, possibility, more of a possibility. And in fact, this is our theme for our Royal Society Summer Science Exhibit that we have just been informed that we were successful with. And I realized, Mr. Chairman, when you announced the National Astronomy Meeting that there are a few days that actually coincide with that, but three days after the NAM still gives you an opportunity to come to Royal Society and see our exhibit. So I think I, I'm almost done. I just have a couple more messages to give you, and I must acknowledge uh, people who have helped me, the funding bodies. Um, we are trying to put together a lot of information about lunar exploration, about moon, about the entire UK community's contribution towards lunar exploration. And we have a website called Open Learn. So don't worry about this long um, you know, uh, link. But just go on Google and say open learn. Once you are in open learn, if you type moon, you will get there. Right? And those of you who like tweeting can actually take note of these two hashtags, moon matters and living on the moon. Right? And if you want, you can tweet and you can express your opinion or you can give us lots of advice. With that, I think I will stop. Thank you. Absolutely great. So, questions, please. Uh, yes, Stephen. Uh, 
Thanks. That was a really, really interesting talk. And I, I liked your point about uh, it being an important anniversary next year, not just of the moon landings, but of other things. And now, the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, they have their 100th anniversary uh, next year. And they're going to run uh, 100 hours of astronomy. So this is continuous observing and lots of public-facing stuff. And the moon will be at first quarter then, so it will be a, a fantastic time for the public to get involved. And so the Society for Popular Astronomy will be putting out a bunch of advice for people to get involved. So I'm afraid this was one of those horrible uh, comment, not a question questions. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, there's a question at the back. Fascinating. Thank you. What do you think we can learn or have learned from lunar water sample returns, future lunar water sampling, about the origin of water on the moon and on Earth? I'm thinking about the uh, comet hypothesis, isotope ratios, mm -hmm. etc. So, so thank you very much for the question. Um, I think right now uh, the jury is out. Uh, more and more we study these samples, we are finding that there are probably multiple sources. Now, on balance, uh, what we have in hand seems like what we call asteroids. So to mark my word, I say what we call asteroids. They appear to be the type of material that could have been the source of water on the Earth and the Moon. But tomorrow, if you decide to call the asteroids comets or comets asteroid or something else, I don't know. But from the isotopic ratio point of view, the currently it seems like the majority of the water on the Earth and the Moon is very similar to what we see in the asteroidal material. In, sorry? In the asteroidal material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Question down here. Well, again, thank you for a very fascinating talk. Um, what are the best sort of bets as to the explanation why they're mare on this side of the moon, but very few, very little on the far side? What, what's the cause of that asymmetry? So there are a couple of um, ideas out there, I think, for quite some time. One is the crustal thickness. So the crust is much thicker on the far side, as you saw. And, and these Mare regions are expressions of volcanic activity in low-lying areas. So one theory is that if you don't have low-lying areas, if you have a lot of overburden, you're not allowing any volcanic material to come up. So they've had the impact. They've had impacts, but they're not. The, 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 so both sides would have had impact that would have created craters. But because the crustal thickness is much more on the far side. Those craters were not deep enough to allow for the material to come on the surface. That's one hypothesis. The second hypothesis is that there is uh, an anomaly, as I showed you, with regards to thorium on, on the near side. And that's a heat producing element. So it is that actually have we concentrated somehow through some mechanism a lot of thorium on the near side that then caused the melting of the lunar mantle, which then expresses itself on the surface. Right? So that's why we need a global sampling of the moon in order to confirm that, yes, thorium did play a role or didn't play a role. And there are a few other you know, ideas out there, but to me, I mean, at the moment, these two are probably the main reasons. Thank you very much for a most interesting talk. Uh, shall we thank my national